Good morning. I'm Lynn Bueller of the class of 1967, and I'm here to introduce to you today our most illustrious class member, Dr. Lee McGeorge Durrell. Dr. Durrell is truly a world famous scientist. She has devoted her life to saving species from extinction. I'm not exaggerating when I use the term world famous. Queen Elizabeth II has honored her with membership in the very prestigious Order of the British Empire for her contributions to biodiversity. If I were to list all her accomplishments and awards and honors, I would still be listing when the lunch bell rings. And that assumes I only hit the highlights. So let me just hit my favorite highlight. When we were little girls in lower school at St. Mary's, younger than all of you here, even the sixth graders, Lee was the first one in our class to have a guinea pig for a pet. <laughs> and I remember the first time that I met the guinea pig, I spent the night with Lee, and as we got to her house, we ran immediately to the little pig pen to greet the guinea pig. And I looked on in astonishment as Lee greeted that guinea pig in its own guinea pig language. <laughs> Not only that, but I was even more surprised when the guinea pig understood her and spoke back. <laughs> so ever since that time in lower school, little Lee McGeorge and later grown up Dr. Durrell has been speaking to and on behalf of the animals. Along the way, she has earned a PhD, married another famous wildlife conservationist, published books, delivered countless lectures, worked thousands of hours in the field, and as many of you saw Sunday night, if you watch PBS, she's become a documentary film star. So I will leave you with just this one thought. If you give her a very warm welcome, she might just greet you in guinea pig. <laughs>Anyway, good morning, St. Mary's, and thank you all for having me here today. Uh, I'd like to share with you some important lessons that I've learned from my life, but because my life now spans seven decades, and I've only got uh, about 15 minutes to speak, it's going to be quite a job, but uh, I will try. So here goes. If I could have the first uh, slide, please. Do you all recognize them, or are you too young? <laughs> I know, I know the people in this peanut gallery recognize. That's Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley was 14 years old, living in Memphis, Tennessee, which is when and where I was born. Next picture, please. That's me with my darling mother when I was two years old. I was given a bride doll for Christmas and a little trunk to put all her clothes in. And my mother delighted in telling the story that I threw all the clothes away and put a dead squirrel in the trunk. <laughs> So I was animal crazy as a child. I had lots and lots of pets, as Lynn said, dogs, cats, guinea pigs, certainly. But I also had alligators, turtles, frogs, um, spiders, caterpillars, earthworms, and that sort of thing. My parents were very tolerant of these house guests, but for some reason my mother drew the line at snakes. I never really quite understood why. Now, I attended St. Mary's from the age of five, and I vividly recall uh, that one day in the third grade, the egg case of a spider, next picture, please, there it is, the egg case of a spider that I'd found in the playground, or actually in the field behind the playground, um, and kept in my desk. And suddenly that egg case started hatching out. And the teacher, the teacher made everybody in the class get up and leave while I scooped up the little spiderlings that were just pouring out of my desk like that. <laughs> she was not really terribly pleased with me, as you can imagine. I had some fantastic um, uh, biology teachers at St. Mary's, one in particular who happens to be sitting here in the third row, Mrs. Baker. Yay. <laughs> and I know it was Mrs. Baker's efforts 
that were responsible for me getting into Bryn Mawr College, can I have the next picture please, uh, and into the advanced placement biology course in my freshman year. Now, disaster struck on the very first day when the professor asked in a stentorious voice, have you ever dissected the head of a dogfish? And I didn't even know what a dogfish was. Sorry, Ms. Baker, I don't think I paid attention to that lesson. <laughs> anyway, so what I did was I switched my major uh, to immediately that same day to philosophy. Now, my favorite philosopher, if I can have the next picture, please, Yes, that's it, was uh, a French Jesuit priest called Teilhard de Chardin. And I just thought his work was fantastic. What he was able to do was to reconcile his religious beliefs with the sciences. He had a big cosmic theology, and, it was, and he could re reconcile his beliefs with um, science studies, and particularly with Darwinian evolution. And um, very sadly, his works were banned by the church uh, during his lifetime. Now, then in the spring of my third year at Bryn Mawr College, um, I was watching a broadcast by the beloved CBS newsreader, Walter Cronkite. Do any of you all know who Walter Cronkite was? Next, next picture, please. There, there he is. And, and listening to that broadcast absolutely changed my life. Now, Cronkite had been profoundly moved by um, this image. Next image, please. It's called Earthrise. I know you've probably seen it, but it was the um, picture of the Earth from taken on Christmas Eve from the Apollo 8 mission. Cronkite strongly believed that human beings had a sacred duty to protect the Earth. And yet every day he was receiving news of the destruction of rainforests and the slaughter of wildlife. So he put together a series of reports that he called Can the World Be Saved? And it was the one I was watching in which he defined ecology. And for me, this was a, a defining moment because it pulled together my original passion and love for animals and nature with the work of the philosopher who inspired me the most. So I finished my philosophy major, but I took extra courses in the sciences and got into graduate school in the Department of Zoology at Duke University. And there I became fascinated by, next image please, the lemurs of Madagascar, because there was a famous lemur research facility um, at Duke University, and I had a part-time job feeding and cleaning the animals there. So I decided I had to do my PhD research in Madagascar. Well, Madagascar was a paradise to a young zoologist. Uh, next slide, please. Because of the amazing and weird and fantastic animals and plants that had evolved there over millions and millions of years of Madagascar's isolation. I have to admit, though, I paid a lot more attention to my um, pets than to my studies. So I had a little hawk, next picture. Uh, next picture was my adorable little fruit bat I named Dorian. And in the next picture is my lemur. I had several sorts of lemur, but this one was my favorite one. He was a kind of a cheeky red collared lemur and I called him Chico. Now aside from enjoying my animals, life um, was pretty difficult in Madagascar. Various events befell me, uh, such as the night I was attacked in the forest for people believed I was an evil spirit because I worked at night listening to the animals. Um, the day that the roof of my hut was torn off in a cyclone and I had to move in with a, a missionary family. Uh, there was also a military coup, followed a week later by a presidential assassination, followed by another coup and all the international flights to and from Madagascar were grounded for six months and I couldn't get out. Anyway, I eventually made it back to Duke and I started uh, writing up my, my dissertation there. But my life changed once again when I had the amazing fortune to meet my greatest hero. And uh, this is a man who was in the States on a lecture tour and it was, next picture, the famous writer, naturalist and conservationist, Gerald Durrell and whose books I'd first read uh, in the Mission Library in Madagascar. Well, Jerry and I hit it off. He invited me to visit his unique zoo in Jersey. Now, this is old Jersey. This is one of the islands in the English Channel um, for, for which New Jersey is actually named. And in the next slide, please, there I found a zoo like no other zoo. It was set in 25 acres of beautiful countryside, uh, there were breeding programs underway for some of the world's most endangered species. 
uh, zookeepers were planning field trips to do research and to rescue species, and young gorillas were playing on the, on the lawn of a, a 17th century manor house. Well, I was pretty mesmerized, as you can imagine, and uh, Jerry and I got married in 1979, and he often joked that he was the only man in the world to have been married for his zoo. <laughs> now, Jerry created his zoo in 1959. He'd become disillusioned with the zoos of the day, which were generally run just for entertainment or for profit. Jerry decided that his zoo would be revolutionary and that it would be totally concerned with wildlife conservation. Four years after setting up the zoo, if I could have the next slide, please, Jerry established a charitable trust, it, uh, that is a not-for-profit organization, we call them trusts over there, uh, to run the zoo on conservation principles and to start conservation projects all over the world. Jerry's mission was to save species from extinction, and we literally wrote it in stone uh, on a big stone that's at the entrance to the zoo. Just checking to make sure that's the right picture. Well, Jersey Zoo is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year, but the Trust has remained a relatively small organization compared to, say, San Diego Zoo or the World Wildlife Fund. But something Jerry always said was that he wanted his zoo to be small but perfect. But during those 60 years, we've made some remarkable progress including saving dozens of species. Most challenging case was for a small hawk, next picture please, uh, that came from the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. Now, this is called the Mauritius kestrel. It was down to only four birds known to exist. Can't much get much closer to extinction than that. And so many of the conservationists of the day said, oh, just give up on it, it's a lost cause. Well, using the phrase lost cause was like a red rag to a bull to Jerry. And uh, with the various techniques that our team developed, uh, we've turned the corner for this bird. Next picture, please. And there are several hundreds now flying free on the island of Mauritius. Another success story is that our zoo is home to what Jerry liked to call his mini university for conservation. Next picture, please. We now call it the Durrell Conservation Academy. We have trained thousands of people from most of the countries of the world in the techniques of species recovery and what they learn with us uh, from our keepers, from our animals, they go back to their homelands and put that into practice for the endangered species in their countries. Now my biggest role in uh, conservation work was to start the recovery process for a species, next slide please, of large tortoise from Madagascar. It's called a plowshare tortoise. It was down to fewer than 200 individuals. I worked on that project for 15 years, going to and from Madagascar, and it led to, next slide please, um, local people giving me a special nickname. And that nickname was Dadini Anganuki, and that means the grandmother of the tortoise. <laughs> so I was very proud of that nickname. Now I also had the privilege to work with Gerald Durrell on books, television, radio programs, and our first collaboration was on a book that became hugely popular, uh, next picture please, called The Amateur Naturalist, and this was about how to study natural history in the various ecosystems around the world. We followed writing this book by a television series based on the book, and repeated this formula of, of book, television, television, book, several times in the 1980s. I've got some shots there from those days, so next slide please. And we, the three of those were from this amateur naturalist. So we studied ponds, we, studied, we rode little Camargue ponies to study the marshlands in the Rhone Delta in the Camargue in France. Um, you'll see at the bottom, bottom middle one, I'm standing there, we're in South Africa studying termite ecology, and I was engaged in the great toilet paper experiment, which you'll just have to look at the film to see what I mean. Um, we also, up in the upper, upper left, is a picture of us with, with Jerry holding a huge egg. That was in Madagascar, so we did a series in Madagascar. That was the heaviest bird that ever lived, sometimes called the elephant bird or the apionis. Now extinct, it was um, made extinct by people about 400 years ago. But you can still find its eggs in sandy riverbanks, so we were privileged enough to see one of those. We also were very privileged to um, be able to go to the Soviet Union. We were the first natural history film crew to be in the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And so down, I think, on the, yeah, oh, sorry, can we go back? Yeah. Down on the left is Jerry and me at a rehab center for griffin vultures. 
and uh, in the upper right we, we were in the tundra studying musk ox and such, and they gave us a huge mammoth tusk, a tusk of a woolly mammoth, which we couldn't quite get back, back home to Jersey. Now, our last TV series was about a trip to Madagascar, again, to catch the rare and elusive lemur, the eye eye. So that's that next picture. Thank you. Uh, it had never before been bred in a zoo, and so we captured some specimens, uh, brought them back to Jersey, where immediately they began to reproduce. This expedition was very hard on Jerry. It really, um, his health really never recovered, and he passed away in 1995. Well, I assumed the, his mantle of honorary director, so my duty became much more ambassadorial and fundraising rather than sort of operational. But that gave me a chance to do something I'd always wanted to do, and that is to learn to, next slide, fly. Uh, with my wonderful partner, Colin, whom you see there, he's Scottish, by the way, we flew animals between Jersey Zoo and zoos in the UK and Europe to their various breeding program exchanges. Great fun, great adventures, but some really scary moments too, like the time when we flew back from Majorca, an island in the Mediterranean, up to Jersey, and um, we had a precious cargo of hornbills. Hornbills are big, huge boats really with, with great big um, bills, hard bills. And we were flying, we were over the Pyrenees and we heard this loud knocking sound and we thought we'd had an engine failure. And it turned out to be one of the hornbills just tapping against his crate like that. Oh, it was pretty scary. <laughs> now, my current project is to renovate, next picture please, a big old house that Colin and I bought last year on the Greek island of Corfu. Previous time? Oh, it's not. Oh no, you can't see my house. <laughs> oh, sorry. Anyway, I wanted you to see it because it's very reminiscent. I think some of you may have been watching the television series called The Durrells in Corfu that just ended a couple of weeks ago, and my house is very reminiscent uh, of that house. And if you've been watching this series, you know that Gerald Durrell grew up, had his spent his childhood um, in this enchanting island um, where he developed his passion for animals. And for me to come back to Corfu and have a house there really feels like things have kind of come full circle. Now, uh, it's a rather daunting project. That's why I wish you'd seen the house, because it's rather big. But uh, I've always appreciated the teachings of the 13th century Persian poet, whom you might know, Rumi. Rumi, who, who said, begin a project as huge and foolish as Noah. It doesn't matter what people think. Um, so there are a few other lessons from my life that I would like to share with you. And now we can put up that final slide, please, Catherine. A few other lessons. First of all, don't hesitate to be inspired, whether it's by a photograph, a philosopher, a newsreader, a hero, or even a fantasy like living in Madagascar or flying airplanes. If you then need to explore thoroughly that inspiration and where that's going to take you. Second, understand that size is not everything. Uh, quality is. And remember Jerry said, be small but perfect. And finally, when the chips are down and you feel you can't see the way forward, don't give up. In your lifetime, I'm sure you will face the equivalent of some of the challenges that I faced, whether it was cyclones or military coups or, or making last ditch efforts to save an endangered species. You have to be patient, think things through, gather your resources, and never believe that a cause is lost until that cause has truly disappeared. A famous conservationist once said, there are no hopeless cases, only people without hope. So thank you all very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.